Okay, well, man, I want to get into the Word today, uh, and we're going to start, we're going to start uh, a series, we're going to go through a lot of people, it's the 10 suggestions, and that you can do this if you want, but you don't have to, and you know, what is it to you? Well, you determine what it is, you determine whether this, uh, it, what God says in Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 1, you determine whether this is uh, something you're going to abide by or you're not going to abide by. And it, it can be a suggestion to you, or you can say, you know what, God told me to do this, I will do it. We, we in, in America, you know, because it says Ten Commandments, we have a problem with that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm my own person. And but what we, I want to, to convey to you in that is this. When God gave the Ten Commandments, he was trying to add to life, not take away from life. Amen. He said, don't kill because he didn't want anybody killing you. He said, don't steal because he didn't want anybody stealing from you. And so he was trying to add to life. What we'll find in the, the uh, Ten Commandments is the relationship guidelines that will enhance your life and bless you. And the first few commandments talk about our relationship with God, and then the others talk about relationships with one another and the culture in which we live in. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about these guidelines for successful relationships in life. And this is where this is where so many people in our country have missed it. And it's about relationship. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about relationship, and that's what God. Uh, intended when he gave the commandments. And, he, and as you, you have a handout with you, it says Jesus and the Ten Commandments. You know, some people say, well, that's Old Testament. That's not for today. Listen, the Old Testament is for today, too. And the principles in the Old Testament are true. And, and many of them are reaffirmed again in the New Testament. And we're going to go through the Ten Commandments and, and put a scripture with every one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, because they are, for today, the, the, old, the Ten Commandments are good. They're good for all eternity. And listen, this is what's good. You're gonna, these are guidelines for heaven. You need to learn them on the earth. So you're ready for heaven. Now the first one is, uh, have no other gods before me. In Matthew 4, 10 it says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So the first commandment, I'm going to label it first fruits. First fruits. God is first. There is no other, no other gods. God is first. I like what it says in Isaiah um, chapter 45 and verse 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Now in, our, in, in the world today, they try to tell us there's many gods. Do you know that the nation of Israel came out of bondage in Egypt? They were there for 400 years. God supernaturally delivers them out through miracles and, and brings them to this place and, and calls Moses up on the mountain. And God gives Moses these Ten Commandments. Now the nation of Israel for 400 years were in Egypt. Egypt had 29 main gods. And 2,000 lesser gods. So they were in a culture that was steeped in, in idols and all kinds of gods. Scripture tells us there's only one God. Amen. Now listen. There's a lot of lesser spiritual beings in the spirit realm. We call them demons or disembodied evil spirits. And they're floating around trying to influence you and I. And they love attention. They love to get your praise and adoration. And, and they love it when you, you take an idol and you attribute to them uh, an attribute that should be God's. And so the nation of Israel comes out of this and God says, listen, I'm going to give you some guidelines for being successful. You've lived in a culture for 400 years that has infiltrated your mind, emotions, and your spirit. And what the problem was this. 
Israel came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of them. And even when they were free from Egypt, they wanted to worship idols. And God is giving them directions and saying, no, there is one God, I am him, no other gods. Stop all that kind of stuff. Throw it away, because when you're worshiping these lesser gods, you're worshiping demons. Don't do it. He was, he was saying this for their benefit and for their welfare. Because he knew that if you serve demons, it's not going to turn out good for you. And so he is trying to encourage them to stay away and not get involved in that. There's only one God. There's only one creator. Keep him first place. Listen, you will either keep God first place or you will create another God. Uh, in America today, we have a lot of gods. You know, they have uh, Egypt was polytheism. There was many gods. In America today, we also have many gods. And we need to be careful and not be deceived. In our culture today in America, they're telling us there's many ways to God. Buddha and, and uh, all these other gods. And, and there's many ways to be happy and fulfilled in life. You don't need God, the creator, the God of Abraham. You don't need Jesus. We have financial prosperity in America. You don't need to trust in God for your finances, you know. This is a land of plenty, and, 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 and we have a lot of people that worship money. I remember I was talking to a guy one time, and, and uh, well, it was my dad. And he was going, he was divorced from my mother at the time, blowing our family high and wild. And, and I said, well, Dad, well, what about God? Because he, he, he raised me in the church every, every Sunday we were in church. And he taught me about God. We had family devotions. But he got, to, he got prosperity and he started worshiping money. It pulled him away from God. Changed his lifestyle. And he said to me, Tim, he says, you can take everything away from me, but you'll never take away the ability to make money. And that was true. Because God had given him the ability to make money. It was a God-given gift. The Bible says the gifts of God are without repentance. God doesn't take them back. And when he, when he honored God, he flourished and made a lot of money. When he turned his back on God, he still made a lot of money, but he didn't flourish. His life became shambles because he started following the God of money. Listen, you keep Jesus first place in your life no matter whether you're in want or in abundance keep Jesus first place don't ever push him out of that place in your life and that's what God is saying here listen if you push me out of first place in your life you will serve something God made us as humans we have to serve something it's in our DNA it's in our nature we have to serve something he created us to be servants. And we can, we can tell ourselves, oh, I'm not a slave to anybody. I'm not a servant to anybody. I serve myself. I, I, I. And what we're doing is establishing ourselves as a God. We call it humanism. And humanism has contaminated the culture in America today. Just like the nation of Israel was contaminated by the culture of Egypt, we in America are being contaminated by humanism. Humanism says this, that you are a God. You can determine right or wrong. You don't need Jesus. You are a God. I remember uh, back in the middle 80s and I was going to Kearney and going to work on my master's. And uh, I'm taking a class there. And after two sessions, I, uh, I went to the professor after the class. And I said, sir, you don't believe in absolute truth, do you? He said, oh, yeah, I do. I believe what I think is truth is an absolute for me, and what you think is truth is an absolute for you. And I thought, wow, how dangerous is that? We're not going to use the standard of the Bible. In fact, in our country today, we don't want to use the standard of our constitution of our country. We don't want that standard. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We don't want any re restrictions like that because we look at that as being bad when in actuality... It is very good. 
But we have, we have humanism as infiltrated. Humanism in our nation today says, if I want to be a woman, I can be a woman. It, yeah, I may be born biologically of the male species, but if I say I want to be a woman, I can be a woman. I am a God. I can recreate myself. If you don't like the way God created you, recreate yourself. And then what really tees me off is they, I have, they, they try to command me to honor that and believe that they're right. That tees me off. They want to alter our whole culture. We're right. And I'm going to tell you something. That is demonically inspired in their life. And for us to say, we're going to give place to them, and we're going to agree, okay, it's okay, I will honor you as a woman, that's demonic. Amen. And we in our nation today are, are coming up against some, some cultural wars. And we as a church better be ready for it. Because they're going to come against us, and they're going to say, you will honor that person as a woman. And if you don't, we'll pull your tax exempt status, and we'll even throw you in jail. We as a church need to wake up and realize the culture that we're living in and how it's influencing us and, and trying to shape in our nation to be anti-Jesus. You can say the word God because there's many gods. You are a god. There's many other gods, but you mention Jesus, and you're in trouble. Now you just offended me. Well, whoopee did Have a good day. <laughs> but it's the culture we're living in. We need to keep God first. In Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, it says, it's the last verse of the chapter, I believe. It says that there was no king in the nation of Israel, and everybody did what seemeth right in his own eyes. No standard for everybody to rally around. Just do what you think is right, and it's okay. So, if I think it's, it's right to beat you up, to trash your car and break your windshield, it made me feel good. And it's okay. Because I am a God. I can determine right or wrong for me. And if it infringes on you, that's your tough luck. So humanism says, you are a God unto yourself. You determine right and wrong. You do what you feel is right. Who is anybody else to tell you that you're not right? So we've taken the standard of right and wrong and, and, and reduced it down to whatever you think is right or wrong is right for you. Whatever you think is right or wrong is right for you. And, and, and there's chaos in our country. There is chaos in our country because we violated a principle from Scripture. And only God can turn this around. You know, everybody doing what seemeth right in their own mind. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell me what to do. The law is not going to tell me what to do. Reminds me kind of a of a four-year-old child or a two-year-old child in a home saying to the parents, you ain't going to tell me what to do. I to make my own decision. I choose what I'm going to do. And you just got to put up with it. And you just got to love me and tell me how great I am. Well, I do what I want to do. And I don't want to do what you want me to do. I ain't going to do it. Chaos in the home. In a lot of homes, children are raised in that chaos. I say there's got to be a standard in the home. There is a right or a wrong, and that child is going to comply with it. And if that child doesn't want to comply with it, and it is blatantly rebellious, I will take strong action against that. The Bible says, how do you deal with rebellion? You beat it out of them. <laughs> no, I don't believe in child abuse, and I believe that, you know, <laughs> but I'll tell you what. I also don't believe in letting the child just do whatever they want whenever they want. There's got to be guidelines. There's got to be restrictions. And that's what God is saying here. Listen, if, if you don't honor him as God, you will create gods. In the culture, you'll create gods. 
and there'll be gods that'll create slaves of you, and you will not enjoy the end result. In our nation today, we're seeing the end results of humanism, and it's caused chaos and disruption in our culture. God never wanted that to happen in America. But because we took God out of our schools, and we, we've, we've taken uh, prayer out of our schools, we've, we, you know, I went to Kearney, a rural Midwestern college, a small college in the mid-80s, and run into humanism. Because our colleges have become hotbeds and strongholds of that kind of mindset and ideology. And we're sending our kids into that environment thinking it's not going to affect them. Listen, it will affect them. And we need to be very aware of that and teach our kids and train our kids what the culture is like and what it's trying to do. They want to take Jesus out of every person's life in America. We don't need Jesus. We have a better idea. Look how prosperous we are. Look how, how blessed we are. And, and, and we, we attribute it to ourselves. You know when Moses was on the mountain, he's having this encounter with God. And, and he gets the Ten Commandments. He comes off the mountain, and what does he find? He finds that the nation of Israel has made, had donated gold, and they made two golden calves. And they're sitting there worshiping the golden calf, saying, oh, thank you for bringing us out of Egypt, out of bondage. We honor you, old golden calves. They got out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't get out of them. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We live in a culture in America today. If we are not careful, and if we don't stay grounded in the word, we're going to find our, ourselves affected by the culture we live in, and, and our faith is going to be watered down. And we're going to say, well, it's okay, you know. Yeah, hey, that sounds good. Listen, I don't care how good it sounds. If it goes against the Bible, it is wrong, and it is bad. And we need to know what the word says. And we need to learn to say, this is going to be my guide in life. I choose to obey this. I don't care what my culture does. I choose to obey this. And God knows that if we don't put, keep him first place, something else will take first place in our life. And the end result is not going to be beautiful. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, 9, talking about first fruits and talking about putting God first. And we find all through scripture, we find this principle. God is first. God is first. It says here, verse 9, you, have, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. The whole nation of you are doing it. Now listen, it's not God that put the curse on them. They put the curse on themselves. And, and there's a lot of people that have put a curse on themselves because they don't want to give money to God. I made it. It's my money. You're making a God out of your ability to make money. Who gave you the ability to make money? God did. But you're taking ownership of it, saying, God has nothing to do with this. It's, it's me, and it's all my money. You now have created another God in your life. And you've taken and put that God first place, and now Jesus is some in the backseat or maybe even in the trunk. <laughs> and for a lot of people, he's not even in the car. But you bring it on yourself. You don't want to honor God? You don't want to give him first place in your life? You don't want to give him first fruits in your life? You're the one that brought the curse on yourself. God just knows it's going to happen. It's like, it's like the laws of uh, seed time and harvest. If a farmer says, I do not want to honor those laws of seed time and harvest, I'm just going to plant the seed and farm the way I want to farm. And, and the way I want to farm is the way it ought to be. And so then all the laws of nature have to comply with me. It ain't going to work. And then when it doesn't work, you get mad. It's God's fault because it's not working. If God really loved me, he would let me do this and this and this, and he would bless me, and he did, you know. No. You, you got the cart before the horse. 
Jesus is first. He put the laws into action. He says, obey the laws of sowing and harvesting. Reaping, uh, sowing and reaping. Obey those and you'll be blessed. You violate those and you're going to hurt yourself. It's like the law of gravity. I don't like the law of gravity. I'm going to jump off the Empire State Building and have a wonderful day. <laughs> For about 15 seconds. Then you're going to make a mess. And a lot of people then blame God. God just wrote me right. God just did what I wanted. Humanism is the ultimate of selfishness. But it says here, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now this day, says the Lord, host, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until it overflows you. God's desire is to bless you. God's desire is to pour into your life. But when you say, I'm not going to do it God's way, you shut God out. You violate the laws that he established so that he can bless you. And when you, when you do that, when you cut God out and you push his principles away in life, you bring yourself into bondage. And a lot of people do that and then they blame God. That's ignorance gone to, to sprout. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And a lot of, even a lot of Christians stumble over paying tithe. Pay tithe. Tithe is Old Testament. Tithe is of the law. No, it isn't. Tithe was way back there with Adam and Eve in the garden. Bring the first fruits. Cain did not bring the first fruits. He brought of the harvest of his ground, but it wasn't first fruits. Abel brought the first fruits of his, his sheep. God honored the first fruits. Listen, God set this up from the very beginning, just like He set up the law of gravity. And if you want to honor it, there's a blessing for you. If you do do not want to honor it, it'll be hard for you. Things are going to happen for you that you're not going to like, and you'll really see them in eternity. And when that happens, don't blame God. He says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you may not, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor your vine in the field and cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. God says, I will take care of you. I will protect you. I will bless you. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land. Bring first fruits. Another passage in the New Testament where Jesus talks about in chapter 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first Jesus. Seek first his kingdom. Keep him in first place in your life. Honor him. And then the second uh, Guideline for success in life is Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt make, shall not make unto thee any graven image. In Luke 16, 13, it says, you can't serve two masters at the same time. You can't serve God and the devil. You can't serve money and, and put money first place in your life and honor God the way he's supposed to be honored. You can't do it. God's given you an ability to make money. He's put you in a nation that's very prosperous. And as you attain prosperity, you say, Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the blessing into my life. I honor you now. Here's a tithe. Thank you, Jesus. You see, giving to God is an expression of gratitude and thankfulness. And when you refuse to give to God, and appreciate the gifts and the abilities he's giving you, then he goes into some other place in your life and you exalt yourself. And, and you are now in the religion of humanism. I did it. My money. 
my ability. That's humanism. That's pagan. Ungodly. It is a sin to treat God that way. I, I, I la label the second one purity. Purity means to be cleansed of all unholy motives, a clean heart, moral correctness, clean and unmixed. The word purity means unmixed. They, they, they uh, rate alcohol by the purity of alcohol. Like, it's 80 proof. I don't know much about alcohol. What is it? Some vodka, 100 proof? 50% alcohol. Uh, but I want to be 100% Jesus proof. I want a pure life. I want to walk in purity before God. I want to honor him uh, in that fashion. Matthew 5, 8 says, the pure in heart shall see God. And maybe we could say it this way. The pure in heart will see the things of God. They will recognize the blessing of God in their life. They will recognize the awesomeness of the creation and, and the great job that God did when he created this earth. They will, they will be people that, that have gratitude and thankfulness to God. They're pure in heart. They're 100% God. My life, everything, it's God. It's all about him. It's not about me and what I attain. In Deuteronomy, when it talks about impurity and the nation of Israel coming out of bondage, I want to read these passages to you, chapter 18 and verse 9. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. When you're born into the culture in America, you will learn not to follow the pagan ways of a lot of Americans. But you will learn to honor God first place always in your life. You won't mix, you won't mix the culture of paganism, idolism, with your relationship with Jesus. They don't mix. There's two masters there. You can't serve them both. But I admonish you, choose Jesus. Amen. And he goes on, he says here, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughters pass through the fire. You see, in Egypt, they would sacrifice their own kids in the fire. You would bring your child and offer them to the gods, the demons, and they would be burned to death. You would force them to walk through the fire to death. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine serving and being caught up in that kind of a ideology. But we see it in our world today. We see religions will chop your head off if you don't convert them. We see babies being aborted in our own nation. And it's okay to do it because I, I am the woman and I am the mother of that. And if I want it to live, it can live. If I don't want it to live, it will die. I choose because I am a God. I choose right and wrong. I choose who lives and who doesn't live from my womb. Paganism, humanism, idolatry, sin. And God says, listen, don't, don't get sucked into that. And he goes on, neither shall you practice divination, one who practices witchcraft or one who interprets omens or sorcerers. Now you can get on the phone and call up and, and, and get a demonic word. Listen to a demon. Or one who casts spells or a medium or a spiritualist or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. And, and, and so God says, do not get involved in these. Do not let this affect your life at all. You see, God loves you. And God wants to bless you. And he gave us these guidelines in life. 
gave us these commands in life to us to obey, that his blessing can flow into our lives. Keep him first place in your life. Honor Jesus in all you do and the decisions you make. You see, Jesus created you not to worship idols. An idol is a figure, and, and you know, they shape idols in certain fashions. And, and as I told you, I got a relative, a brother in law, whose uh, mother told his sister they were having trouble selling their house. So she said, Take the image or the idol of St. James. See, in America, we also have idols, <laughs> even in churches. <laughs> Take this idol of St. James and, and dig a hole in your front yard and set it in there upside down and then cover it up again and your house will sell. That's idolatry. And idolatry is this. You take an image or an item and you attribute to it only attributes that come from God. So we're going we're gonna to take this little image and we're, we're going to put the, the attributes to uh, bless us and help us sell a house when we attribute that ability to St. James. And what, here, here's what they believe. They believe that that's an attribute of God and that when you believe and, and attribute that attribute to that idol, that, that idol will be inhabited. By that spirit. It's demonic. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's a demon spirit. That inhabits idols. Listen. I could stay here for over an hour. And just tell you of the demonic activity. That I've helped people defeat in their life. Good. No I don't have time. <laughs> but I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. I got a call. And this, this young man grew up in the church knew Jesus, but was not living the right kind of life. And they called me up, scared to death. Would you come over to the south end of Grand Island to this, this place? And uh, so I went there, and they're sitting in the parking lot. It was his girlfriend and her daughter and him, scared to death. Would not go into their apartment because there was demonic activity going on. They said, we're sitting at our kitchen table, all of a sudden the coffee pot from the coffee maker flies off into the middle of the kitchen, falls and breaks on the floor. Pictures are moving on the walls. Our little girl won't go and play in her room and there's certain items that she won't play with. I said, well, you have some demonic activity. And I said to the young man, and you know this, and you know what's going on here. And you need to get your life right with God. We went into the house. And we took authority over that. And uh, cleansed the house. Blessed it and anointed it with the presence and the power of God. They had no problem since. Amen. And th we've done that so many times. And, and I have people call me from other churches saying, hey, we have demonic activity going on. Could you come and help us? Listen, we as a church need to understand this and be well at, at dealing with the demonic realm. How to defeat the devil. We only do it through the power of Jesus Christ and the blood. It's the only way. You can't talk it out. You can't give enough money to tell. You can't pay a demon off. <laughs> but it says here in Mark. Chapter 5 and verse 6. And seeing Jesus from a distance. He ran up and bowed down before him. This is a guy who was. They shackled and chained him because he was so violent and had this supernatural strength. They could not control him. And, uh, and he'd run around in the graveyards and such and, and uh, the demonic places. And crying with a loud voice, he said, the demon inside this guy said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Even demons know. The most high God in who he is. And they are afraid of him. And we've got people that are allowing demons to deceive them. And they attribute this to that idol and to that stone. And, and 
this to money and this to my ability. Look how great I am making items out of ourselves and our abilities. Rather than attributing it, it's because of Jesus. It's because of God. Impurity, impurity will lead you into bondage. And you don't want to go there. You will not like the end results of that. God desires and deserves your affection because God wants to bless you. God wants to pour into your life. In, in the second commandment, it says that God is a jealous God. And a lot of people misunderstood that. God's a jealous God? Oh, isn't that wrong? Listen, the word jealousy means this. The word, word jealousy means that God watches over you, guarding you for your good. 1 Corinthians, chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says, God is, God is jealous for you with a godly jealousy. In other words, God desires to guard your life from demonic deception and attacks. He desires to guard your life from all the pitfalls and, and the dangers in life. He desires. You know why? Because he loves you. He is Jealous, he has a strong, strong desire to help you in life and to bless you. And he hates to see you beat up and battered by other things in life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. And then we're going to go to prayer. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. The victory, the help in life comes through Jesus. That in everything you were enriched in Jesus, in all speech, in all knowledge. Paul's excited because they were enriched by Jesus. You're not enriched by some stone that you attribute some kind of power to. You, you, you are enriched because of Jesus. Even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm to you the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did God want to do? He did not want you lacking in any gift in his blessings and releasing his favor in your life. He did not want you to lack in that. So keep your position in, in your relationship with the Lord. Keep your position right. Keep your heart pure. Keep Jesus' first place in your life because he wants to pour into your life. Pride says this. I don't need God. I don't need his help. I'll do it my way. That's pride. And the, and the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he draws close to the humble. So when you allow your human pride to operate, you're driving God away. It's not that God doesn't love you and he doesn't want to help you. You drove him away and, and you said, I'll do it my way. And that's kind of the theme of America. You know, Frank Sinatra sang it, made it popular. I did it my way. <laughs> Listen, no, we want to do it God's way. So we honor the first fruits. God is always first in everything. And we, we value purity. Because God wants to bless you and pour into your life. Next week we're going to go into humility. Uh, the third one is thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And, and, and folks, this is something that I really see in the Christian church in America, we've done this. We've taken the name of the Lord in vain. And we need to repent. We'll talk about that next week. Listen, if you're here today and, and, and you look at, at the commandment number one, not to have any other gods, and you say, you know what? I've made a God out of some things in my life. I've put some things first place in my life that shouldn't be there. I'll put TV in front of God. I don't have time for the Bible. I don't have time to pray because I got TV to watch. You just made an idol out of your TV, out of entertainment. 
I don't have time to go to church or to get involved in the things of God because I got fishing to do. Sunday morning is my fish time. Well, then find another time for your God time. But don't push God out completely. We have parents that are running around the country with their kids in sporting activity. They're away from church on Sundays because they don't have time for church because the sporting activity. Oh, I want to be a good parent. I want to be this. I want to be that. Listen, you're robbing your children of spiritual life for the sake of sports. It's an idol. God's not first. It's wrong. Do you know, I, I read a statistic about a week and a half ago, and it was like 0.001% of all the children in America will ever be a professional athlete. I mean, statistics for your child to be a professional athlete are not in your favor. It's time we face reality in life. And I don't care, even if your child is gifted athletically, they need to realize it's a gift from God. I honor God first with it. And that, you know what? I'm not going to rob myself of fellowship with other believers for the sake of my gift or the gift that God gave me. God didn't give you the gift so that you would run with it in a way that would destroy your relationship with him. He didn't give it to you for that. Those of you that are highly gifted, you have some challenges that us that are not highly gifted don't have. <laughs> you have success and things in your life that will, that will push on you in ways the rest of us don't have to deal with. But we all have challenges. We all make a quality decision. I will honor Jesus first. And I will live a life that honors him. Period. Now, if you're here today and, and you're saying, you know what? I think I need a little adjustment. It's like your car it needs a tune-up. We all need spiritual tune-ups. And as as uh, Sai, if you'd come and, and lead us in a chorus here, and let's just spend some time just as you sit there. Let the, the Spirit of God's kind of been stirring in your heart and saying, oh yeah, you know, that's an area I need to watch out for. That That's a potential area that I could stumble in. Oh, you know what? I This is an area that I've taken Jesus out of first place. I want to honor Jesus today. I'm going to put him in first place. I want the very best that God has. No, we haven't taken an offer either, have we? <laughs> I forgot all about it. Sorry. I want to rob you of your opportunity to honor the Lord in an expression of God first. And so as, as this is going, we're going to pass you off your bucket as well. We're going to honor the Lord. We're going to keep you in first place. The Lord, purify our hearts. Anything in our heart, Lord, that would not honor you, any attitude, any thought processes, Father, we, we cast them down, we repent, forgive us, it's sin. Let the Spirit of the Lord talk to you as, as they can lead us in this song.
God bless you. 